Breadbox Media Programming is brought to you by. Do you wish you knew the saints better? Overwhelmed with all the events in Catholic history and just wish you could tie it all together? It's tough work, and even scientists have determined that it takes approximately 400 repetitions to create a new synapse in the brain. Unless it is done with play, in which case it takes between 10 and 20 repetitions. Introducing Saint Cards, where the facts about saints and history are presented in fun and engaging games for ages 4 to 104. Check out Saint Cards at saintcards.com and begin the fun for your family, school, and parish today. Introducing the redesigned CatholicSingles.com, featuring new ways that put the spotlight on the person and their faith, not just a profile picture. For the past 20 years, faithful Catholics have used CatholicSingles.com, and the reimagined CatholicSingles.com website is ready to help single Catholics take the next step in sharing meaningful relationships with other faithful Catholics. Remember, CatholicSingles.com, for faith, fellowship, and love. What are you doing this Lent? The St. Paul Center is streaming their newest video Bible study for free starting Ash Wednesday. Based on Scott Hahn's renowned covenantal theology, this is a study no one should miss. Invite your friends, Catholic or not. Don't miss your chance to see this premium study for free. Go to stpaulcenter.com to sign up today. friends and welcome back to another episode of Lisa Hendy and friends. Thank you so much for your patience with my schedule the last few weeks. No excuses, just life has been busy. I actually um, had a little wonderful adventure with my husband um, that took me away from the microphone last week. So I'm just more than excited to be back today with a wonderful guest. And um, I know that um, if this person is not already part of your life by the time you finish listening to this podcast Don Eden Goldstein will be a great friend of yours through the book that we're going to discuss today Don um, has written um, numerous other previous books including The Thrill of Chase and My Peace I Give You and she actually began her writing career as a rock and roll historian you're going to hear more about that um, using her pen name Don Eden in the 90s Don contributed to the Billboard to Billboard, The Village Voice, Mojo, and Salon, and she co-wrote The Encyclopedia of Singles. She then went on to work in editorial positions at the New York Post and at the Daily News. And at the age of 31, Goldstein, who was raised Jewish, encountered experienced an encounter with the divine, which began a personal transformation that would eventually lead her to enter the Catholic Church. In 2016, she became the first woman to earn a doctorate in sacred theology from the University of St. Mary of the Lake. Dawn is an assistant professor of dogmatic theology in the online division of Holy Apostles College and Seminary, and she's coming to us from Washington, D.C., where she lives. Welcome to the show, Dawn. Eden Goldstein. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's such a treat. Um, as a fan of your writing, I'm just so thrilled today to uh, to talk about this newest book, um, Sunday Will Never Be the Same. But before we dive into that, I always like to ask my guests to start off by just telling us a little bit about their story. And your story blends into the story of this book. So maybe in this case, just tell, a, tell us a short story from your life. <laughs> Oh my gosh, a short story from my life. There are no short stories from my <laughs> life, uh, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, these days when I, uh, at Mass, when I uh, go to uh, daily Mass, I, uh, after receiving uh, the Eucharist, I ask, uh, I ask uh, Cardinal Newman, who is soon to become a saint, if I can uh, pray with, with him at uh, a chapel that was very special to him. It's one that I visited when I was teaching in Birmingham uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's the chapel at what's now known as the Maryvale Institute, where they have the very first sacred heart 
a stained glass window that was brought to England. Uh, and uh, it, it, that was Newman's private chapel when he lived at Maryvale. And having prayed there myself, I just find it a beautiful place to go back to when I pray and to be able to ask blessed soon to be Saint Cardinal Newman if I can pray with him there. It helps me to try to think about the Sacred Heart the way that Newman thought about it. You know, one of his favorite sayings was the saying of uh, Saint, Saint Francis, cor ad cor loquitur, heart speaks to heart. And so trying to pray with the heart of Newman united to the Sacred Heart is for me. Uh, as a writer, as Newman is a great patron of writers, it's a great way to pray oneself into the spirit, pray myself into the spirit of Lent. That is so beautiful, Don. And, you know, I'm going to, as soon as we finish our call, I'm going to look up that chapel and, and find that artwork. I thank you for uh, for sharing that. Um, I'm really interested in um, the release of this book. Um, the, the title of the book, again, is Sunday Will Never Be the Same. And in so many ways, Don, this is um, a very a very poignant and personal memoir. I have to ask you, first of all, why this book at this particular time in your life and in your spiritual life? Thank you for for asking. Um, it, it it's a book that I've wanted to write uh, for many years, ever since I first entered the Catholic Church in 2006. People were saying that I should write about my conversion, and I didn't want to write about it at that time. You know, I now realize it's really a good thing that I didn't because. I wasn't ready to write about it at that point. But also, I thought that I would have to write an autobiography in which I would write about everything that ever happened to me, all my family background and so, and so on. And uh, I didn't really want my entire life to belong to the whole world. I didn't want my entire family history to belong to the whole world. Uh, one wants to have some reverence towards oneself, reverence towards the people one one loves, and so to keep you know some things private. Um, so I, I wrote my other books, The Thrill of the Chaste, My Peace I Give You, Remembering God's Mercy. I rewrote The Thrill of the Chaste in a Catholic edition for Ave Maria Press, because when I when I first wrote it, I was actually still in RCIA. Um, and then uh, a few years ago, I guess about maybe only about two, year, two years ago, I was visiting with a friend of mine in England, the writer Kevin Turley, and he was saying that I should write about, about my conversion, and I told him the reasons why I didn't want to. And he said that I was confusing memoir, which was what he was asking me to do, write a conversion memoir. And I was confusing that with autobiography. Mm -hmm. And he said that it's true that in autobiography, one does write about all the details of one's life, but that in memoir, one only writes about the things that are relevant to one's conversion. And when I learned that, I thought, well, I can do that. You know, <laughs> certainly I can write about the ways that divine grace worked in my in in my life, uh, and and then you know that also has a certain amount of reverence towards myself, towards my relatives, and towards the reader who probably doesn't want to know what I ate for breakfast on a given. <laughs> I don't know, Don. By the time they finish with this book, they may actually uh, they may actually want to, you know, <laughs> it, it, having read, um, you know. Um, a good number of spiritual memoirs. I have to say that your book is really unlike any that I've read recently. Um, probably first of all, just in the, in that, um, the perspective that you come to the book from is, um, is so personal. In fact, first person. Um, so to set up for the listeners, just a little bit about the book kind of, um, 
you need to know that Don has this background, this fabulous background as a rock and roll journalist. And Don, say a little bit about the design of the book before we launch into the voice of it, just kind of um, how you get the mixtape premise of um, yeah. of a spiritual life. Um, it's, it's kind of shocking that, you know, coming from Catholic Answers, you wouldn't necessarily think that a book on Catholicism and conversion could be so ultimately cool, but this is a really cool <laughs> book. So tell us a little bit about how that happened. I'm so glad to hear you say that because I did want to shock people who were used to Catholic Answers output, which is apologetics. In fact, my editor told me that this was the first book that he had edited that was not apologetics. He did a wonderful job, by the uh, by the way. His name's Todd Agliolaro, and I'm I'm very thankful to, to have worked with him. And and actually, the people at Catholic Answers were so generous to me because I wanted things done in a different way than their norm. I mean, I came in as a new author saying, could I have my friend Steve Stanley design the cover? Now, Steve Stanley has actually won a Grammy Award for his art direction of record album covers. Yeah. And and so, you know, he's certainly a, a very esteemed and qualified person to bring in but you have to picture i mean you've worked at a publisher Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah i know normally it's um designed by committee and the author is the last voice that they listen to exactly i love my publishers but (laughs) exactly and so they actually let me bring in steve and and i gave steve a concept which was that i wanted um Actually, the concept I gave him, uh, nobody knows this. You're the first person I'm telling this to. But I, I actually found what's known as an art sleeve, a sleeve designed for a 45 RPM by the Bee Gees called First of May. And this was not even an American art sleeve. It was a sleeve designed only for Germany, I think. And uh, and it was an image of uh, of a calendar sheet with the first of may and the sheet was being flipped and i uh, said to steve I, i'd like the cover to have a calendar sheet like a desktop calendar um but this one would be for sunday and it would have handwritten on it will never be the same and where the page is being flipped i'd like different items from my life from my past like like a um lipstick and a record and then steve said well there should be a photo of you and i said okay and 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 i wanted the saint maximilian colby image that was very Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. important and then steve added his own touches like that wonderful fabric background which could be a liturgical uh vest uh, vestment or veil or it could be a bedspread you can't quite tell (laughs) (laughs) which also has all kinds of meanings related to the to to, to some of the events uh, described in the in the book and uh, and also um then once he finished that then they brought in the committee at of they not of excuse me my my new publisher uh, catholic answers and and they had some ideas as far as where should the typeface go and uh, they also added a frame to the image of St. Maximilian Colby. That was my editor's idea. But basically, they took what Steve g- gave them and they suggested touching it up. But they really let the image be the way I wanted to be, which was amazing for me. And then they, they came up at the publisher with the idea of the mixtape um art direction, which is brilliant, really. So the inside of the book, I had given every chapter the title of a song. And and I hadn't done that actually with the author's foreword. And my editor said, no, give that a song title too. So I gave the author's foreword the song title, Don't Pass Me By. (laughs) People tend to skip a foreword. (laughs) And this one is significant. Yes, exactly. And and then they at the publisher had the idea of doing the image of a cassette at the beginning of each chapter so that it really completes the the image of the chapter song titles as being tracks on a mixtape it was it was very well done 
So you know you need a Spotify playlist for this, don't you? If you don't I already have one. A YouTube playlist. <laughs> Well, it's it's even once you dive into the words that are beyond this phenomenal design, you're going to really be blown away because what Don shares here is just such a personal story. And um, it's as we mentioned earlier, it's written in first person. And, and we really have a peek at your early life in what is a child like voice because you really begin at a very tender age of around five years old with some of your your first recollections um and you know we hear your voice um grow and all and alter from there but i'm kind of curious about how it was to kind of go so back into your consciousness and and stir up those old memories and how you sort of um, were able to pinpoint particular details what was that like for you it's always an interesting process. I, I used a process similar to that, which I used with other books where I had some uh, autobiography. It, actually, in each of my books, there's been some autobiography, um, not always because I wanted to put it in, but because I had editors who said, like with my piece, I give you healing sexual wounds with the help of the saints. We need more personal anecdotes. You know, my tendency has been to get away from my personal story because uh, I've uh, felt uncomfortable relating it. It's it's much more comfortable to write about about others. But for this book, I came to really enjoy it. And I think the first person helped a lot. Um, I had learned to write in first person actually as a child when I would uh, read books about dream interpretation. I was very interested in, 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 in dreams. And these books say that if you're writing a dream diary and you want to remember your dream, you have to write in the first person. So I always thought of first person as being, not first person, I'm sorry, not just first person, but first person present tense. Forgive me. Uh, as a, a friend of mine who's a priest says, words are hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so yes, so in a dream diary, you want to make it present tense, and that is helpful for memory. And uh, I discovered that that really is the case, that if I'm trying to remember something, it's much easier to remember it by saying, I'm walking down the street than I was walking down the street. If, if you take it with that immediacy, then details come to you that wouldn't have come otherwise. And so that, that's why I chose the present tense for the book. And I suppose if I'd wanted to, I could have, you know, written it all in present tense and then changed it back to past tense. But I liked keeping it in the present tense because with past tense, then the reader is always thinking that the author is at some distance from the events. Um, but with the present uh, tense, it removes that distance so that the reader can actually see grace working in my life in a way that I don't think they could if I put it at a remove in the past. Yeah, it's, it's so effective. And um, it found it made me I, I think for um, listeners out there, one thing I'll say is that what this book will inspire you to do is not only to connect more deeply with Dawn's story, but also to kind of go back into your own um, story of conversion. Life is a continual conversion. We're always journeying closer to Jesus, but it'll cause you to kind of go back to moments in your own life um, and ponder them. And so that's what I found myself doing as I as I read it. Um, I want to um, I want to reflect on just a few kind of points in the book that were significant to me. Um, the first was that, it, well, and I guess I should say, um, before I ask this, you mentioned being sensitive to the concerns of your family and your mother is very much a character in your story. So was this book, um, was something that you ran past them before you, you know, hit the, <laughs> the final send button on the last version or are they seeing it for the first time now? Oh, I ran it by my mother and stepfather. And my mother actually gave me a lot of corrections, very few about her own part of the story, but a lot of typo corrections. Oh, <laughs> she's budding a, proofreader. She, she's a great proofreader. <laughs> and even on some things that, you know, she found difficult to read, she still gave me typo corrections on <laughs> 
so I thought that was very sweet and 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 very I don't know what, what I'd say equanimous equanimous of her it was it was generous of her personally in that even though I had related something that where she thought, you know, I didn't give enough of the full perspective as I should have. She still told me where there was a misplaced comma and stuff. <laughs> and saying that is significant because Don's mother, just so our listeners know, um, you know, her, well, Don was raised in an observant Jewish home. Your mother went through her own sort of spiritual seeking um, during your childhood largely. And, you know, so you're the result of um, a family that had a break in marriage and, um, and exactly. your mom's journey, you know, obviously became part of yours so it's good to know that um i i wonder how painful it was for you to revisit an an encounter of abusive um of really child abuse in in um the early chapter how um how was it to to treat that in this way i um i certainly was emotional as i wrote that at the same time i liked being able to write it the way I wanted to write it. You see, if I were doing autobiography, then I would have had to have said, so-and-so did such-and-such such to me, and, and that sort of thing. Whereas with a memoir, I was able to write about it in a way that did show reverence to myself, reverence to the reader, because because with a memoir, one can suggest without having to indicate every detail and i suffer from ptsd myself so i'm uh i'm liable to triggers and i i learned through writing my piece i give you that even when i was trying not to be graphic in writing about abuse that there were certain things where just the mere mention of them would um would be very difficult for some readers uh, so I um, so there, so I used a kind of point of view where at a certain point I just turned the camera away, and you know directors will do that sometimes when depicting scenes of violence they'll show you know the kind of um, the sense that something's not wrong and the buildup of fear but then when the actual violence comes they turn the camera away and they cut to the next scene which is just you know the aftermath and. Uh, I I don't even exactly cut to the aftermath. I cut to two months or a year later where we're no longer discussing the abuse, but you have me, the person who is in some way affected by this and who carries these these wounds through through life and, and who uh, and whose actions are in some way you know affected by having suffered the abuse. So. It, I, I try to think of it cinematically and in terms of how would I want a director to convey something without actually showing it. There's another moment um, that um, really impacted me, and, and this is in a particular chapter where, um, spoiler alert, you're discussing your mom's um Actually, her her I'm assuming it's her baptism. The word is never yes. directly used, but the imagery would connote a baptism into yes, the Catholic Church. And this yes. is happening in October of 1986. And you juxtapose this with a bit, very beautiful image um, of yourself afterwards um, out and on the rock and roll scene, you know, probably in a club at a concert. Yes. And you describe um, your um, your eyeliner becoming stained around your eyes as a result of, you know, the, the evening's events. And uh, there's just this line at the end of that chapter that just I, I underlined it three times and wrote all kinds of exclamation points near it because the imagery there is so beautiful. Say a little bit about um, that, um, that scene for you because it is almost a cin cinematographic we're both having a hard time talking this morning. You don't almost have the sense of cinema um, in that in that imagery. Well, well, cer certainly. Thank you. Yeah, what I'm doing is I'm juxtaposing my experience. Of first, I go to my mother's baptism, and I'm 18 years old, and I'm just uh, thinking 
about the concert that I'm going to afterwards with my with my boyfriend because I was reformed Jewish. I didn't uh, become Christian at the time that my that my mother became Catholic. Um, I wasn't sold on this whole Catholic idea. So I go to the baptism and afterwards I go to a concert with with my boyfriend and the the incident that I described with the with the eyeliner um that's something that's completely and utterly plausible and that happened to me a lot at concerts <laughs> and um and I, I definitely wore eyeliner at that concert. There was definitely a smoke machine. And <laughs> when the smoke machine came out with me standing near the stage, I would have um, very likely teared and my eyeliner would have gotten smeared. Um, but I actually juxtaposed um, a memory from much later with that same boyfriend where when I think of that boyfriend, I I think about how after he dumped me, um, we got back together um, maybe about um, seven years later, at least, maybe maybe um, maybe closer to ten. And I went to a party at his house, and he had white towels, and and I um, and and then after people at the party left, I um, used his towels to wash off my heavy eye makeup. And then he asked me, you know, what's this stain on this towel? Did you use it to wash off your makeup? And I said, no, <laughs> thank, it was before my baptism. So you know, thank, thank God I've been <laughs> washed clean of that lie. But But that event was on my mind when I wrote about this concert that I went to in 1986. And so I, I juxtaposed, you know, that, that image of having my eye makeup stained and then thinking to myself, you know, there, there are 500 people between myself and the nearest source of water. There's no way I can get clean. And I thought that was a good image to juxtapose with my having just attended my mother's baptism because certainly it would not have consciously occurred to me at that time that um that being dirty and having no way of getting clean was in some way you know connected with the fact that i wasn't baptized um but uh you know certainly that's the sort of thing that comes to me now and that that's a benefit of writing in the present tense rather than the past tense, if I wrote that as, you know, my eyes were... Yes. <laughs> there was start. no way I could get clean, I thought. Yeah. You know, it, it wouldn't have that same... Yeah, it definitely type. takes... It definitely takes away the uh, the beauty of the imagery or the grittiness of the imagery. Yeah, well, and I'm trying to... Johannine irony, you know, in, um, in St. John's Gospel, there are all these times when people... When Jesus is saying one thing and people are thinking he means another. Like when uh, the ch woman at the well s says, Lord, give me this water. And she doesn't realize she's asking for, she thinks she's asking for actual water that, that, that Jesus has. And then he explains to her, he's talking about the living water. That, that was what I was really trying to, to, to convey this idea of myself hungering for actual water to wash off my, my eye makeup. Whereas, what I really need is the living water. Well, readers or listeners, when you get to that point in the book, make sure you underline it like I did and draw a <laughs> smiley face next to it. Now that you know the rest of the story, it's, um, it's, I think um, what we need to do now is fast forward the mixtape just a little bit because we only have a little bit of time left um, to really the heart of um, of your story um, and and how you convey your own kind of journey, um, your spiritual journey. And I, I want to um, touch on that, but also just talk a little bit about where you leave us at the very end of the book in terms of your relationship with Mary. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about those, um, those segments of the story. Story. Thank you. Well, the last ti the last chapter of the book is titled "Along Comes Mary," which happens to be one of my uh, favorite 
songs from the 60s, favorite records anyway, um, not so much favorite songs, um, but it, it, it was also produced by Kurt Betcher, who's an important figure earlier in the book. He's a record producer whom I researched and researching his life after he died helped to keep me alive during a dark time of my life. And so it, 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 that's a nice kind of lead in in the book to my, as a Catholic, realizing how much I needed Mary. And I, I feel that for many women like myself who have a mother wound, uh, it can be difficult to uh, get close to Mary. And so I, I wanted to focus the end of the book on on that and on, on um, finding a way to recognize her as a mother in a way that would overcome any wrong ideas that I had about a mother. I should add that, you know, God has been healing my, my, my mother wound and he still, he, he, he still is. God uses these things to, to draw us closer to him. And I'm very thankful also to be able to experience some healing of that mother wound while my mother's still alive. Yeah, that's a um, a beautiful point to make, even for folks who are listening, um, you know, who are Catholic that maybe um, have intellectualized their relationship with the Blessed Mother. You know, I know lots of people who are very Catholic who sort of kind of um, haven't haven't quite embraced um, Mary as mother. And that's the imagery that you share there um, offers a beautiful kind of insight into how you might do this in your own life through the prism of your your own relationship. So it's just a, a stunning work, Don. And um, I really want to point again our, our listeners to Sunday will never be the same. I do think that when <laughs> when you read this, you're, it's going to throw all of your past um, imagery of, um, you know, of what you think um, books about um, the faith might be. And um, you just make sure you have a good space of time when you pick it up because you're not going to want to put it down. <laughs> well, um, Don's book is available at, through Catholic answers at catholic.com and also at probably at your local catholic bookstore at amazon and barnesandnoble.com and we'll have links in our show notes to that i also want to point you to um her website doneden.blogspot.com and make sure you follow her on twitter especially right now with the launch of the book she's at at dawn of mercy and we'll have all those links again in the show notes don any closing thoughts before we let you get on with the rest of your uh, your day Thank you. Well, I, I think that one of the most important points of my book is that God can use our earthly loves as long as they're not sinful in themselves. God can use them to draw us closer to him. And in my case, God used music. And I, having read books that are Christian books that just, you know, speak of rock and roll as the devil's music, I wanted to help people who are rock fans to feel that there is a home for them in in the Christian faith, in, in Catholicism, and that the love that they had of music doesn't have to be just forgotten and erased you know, when they're living a, as Christians, but that uh, that love can be taken up. Everything that's good from that can be take, taken up into their love of uh, of the fullness of, of beauty, which, which is our Lord himself. Well, it's um, it's beautifully played here. In in a sense, it reminds me a little bit of the teachings of my friends um, who are, who serve with the daughters of Saint Paul, who really very much um, call themselves, you know, um, disciples of the popular media and popular culture around us. And that's what you have in this book is just a beautiful examination of one woman's journey um, that will invite you to to consider your own. So, Don, we're so grateful for your time. So now that the the book is out are you already at work on your next best thing or are you at work on uh on getting the word out about this book i'm at work getting the word out about this book this is the book that i really want everyone to uh, to read i'm a professor now and i don't know when i'll have the next opportunity to write a popular book so this is really the statement that i want to leave uh, people people with on a, on a popular level 
Well, it's a beautiful statement and uh, and well played. <laughs> the the uh, the rhythm will stick in your minds, friends. It'll be a, an earworm for you. So again, the name of the book is Sunday will never be the same. Be sure to um, check out our show notes at Lisa Hendy at lisahendy dot com or breadboxmedia dot com um, for all of the links that we've discussed and and get a hold of this book. And maybe this is actually I won't say maybe this is definitely a good book to share with someone that you know who's maybe either been away from the church or just really doesn't have any sense of, um, you know, knowing the church that maybe this can be a gentle lead into, um, give this book as a gift and then maybe go out for Starbucks or a beer, um, and have a great conversation about your journey. I think Dawn and Dawn's, um, personal sharing of her own will invite you into a deeper consideration. Dawn Eden Goldstein, thank you so much for your time today. And, and, uh, just for writing this book, we're really grateful. Thank you so much, Lisa, for having me on. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, too. Well, friends, that's it for this week's episode of Lisa Hendy and Friends. I promise you that I will be back next week with another really um, fun episode. So definitely tune in for that. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, um, head on over to, to iTunes or your favorite podcatcher and leave us a star rating or a review. Even if you don't enjoy it, um, leave me some some critical feedback that will help me to improve, which I'm always looking to do. Um, if you have suggestions for upcoming guests or would like to share some feedback with me, you can also, always reach me at lisahendy at gmail.com or on social media at lisahendy. I am off to tell the rest of my story for today. So until next week, I wish you an awesome week, friends. Have a great day. See you soon. Redbox Media Programming is brought to you by Jack Kane Ford. Find your next Ford Tough vehicle at KaneFord.com. CMF Curo is the country's first Catholic health care ministry to provide an affordable health sharing solution rooted in Catholic teaching and community. Learn more at MyCatholicHealthCare.com slash podcast. That's MyCatholicHealthCare.com slash podcast.